I need you to check your bulletins today. We're not going to go through all of the announcements that we have been doing. So make sure you check your bulletin because all the past announcements for the future are in there. Uh, and especially this one, take note of that one. Um, I've already sent two baby hats to Nancy Pelosi. Um, and the ladies' prayer group is starting up again this week. You want to take special note of that. The Faith and Hope Community Breakfast is on Thursday, April 18th at the Rushmore Civic Center. The special guest speaker is Bob Woodson, and there will be a special introduction by Governor Christy Noem. The tickets are available at Alternative Fuel Coffee Shop downtown. Also save the date for National Day of Prayer. May 2nd, there is one at Main Street Square in the afternoon and one here at Landmark Community Church in the evening. So make sure you get that on your calendar and reserve that date. It's an important one. Just ask me, I'll tell you. Um, located in the back is our offering. We don't pass the plate, but we do take an offering every Sunday. And Mike Wright wanted you to make, uh, make you aware of um, something that the University of South Dakota nursing students are doing on behalf of Mercy Housing. They have a list of items that they need. And so if you would see Mike Wright, if you are interested in helping with that. That's all for announcements. So let's pray. Father God, you are the king of all kings. And you are our great I am, our redeemer. And we come to you this morning humbled at your mercy for our hearts and our souls and our very lives. We thank you, Father, for this house of worship, this place where we can gather, gather together as a family and worship you be in your word and love on you and let you love on us and each other. Lord God, we present ourselves unto you a living sacrifice. And we acknowledge and declare that we are filled with the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. Your word tells us that righteousness exalts a nation. We stand before you in the land that you have given us. And we decree and release the righteousness of Christ into our territories, spheres of influence, our cities, our states, and our nation in order to bring healing, revival, awakening, and reformation to America. Father, let your spirit of righteousness be released and established in us and in every place in which you have given us jurisdiction. Let your righteous kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Prepare the soil of this nation and realign us with your righteousness in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I'm not wearing green. Neither are you. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Forever. Was anybody snowed in? Uh, that was that was quite interesting. I'm glad it wasn't as bad as they said it was. Amen. All right. Okay. That's that that is that is very nice. Let's pray. Let's sing about the great name, the greatest of all names. We're going to be talking about that uh, in the Word today. When somebody finally realizes that there's only one God and how great that God is. Life changes. Life becomes an adventure, doesn't it?
Well, kids could be dismissed at Children's Church. You get to avoid the mud. Good luck to you. We want to get rid of that mud. And um, that, that, that will come somewhere down the, down the road. We want to pray that uh, the ground out there gets dry and kind of firm again or gets real cold again. Probably don't want that to make everything nice and solid. But... Um, we got, we got to fight that until we can put a little asphalt out there. But that will come. Bruce, any news on, on Ethan? Some of you, if, you, if, if you're on the, the land of Graham, you all got a prayer request for a, for a great nephew. And uh, what, what's the newest? Okay, so he's off of the, the extra help to breathe, but uh, not out of the woods yet. Hasn't eaten yet. Okay, so way, way better than he was. Okay, and Nebraska, yeah, the flooding in Nebraska. Oh my. Okay. Are you all hearing now? So, so about half the state's affected. Wow. Okay. All right. Okay, let's pray. Father, we know that all lives matter to you. You love your people so much. And those who aren't even your people yet. And yet... You've done everything, the greatest thing necessary to draw people to yourself. And sometimes it's scary times that, uh, that end up drawing people to you. And people call out to you. And those in Nebraska, uh, so many people affected by this that uh, perhaps people are starting to pray. And uh, 
they're asking for help. And God, we're, we know the greatest thing that, that Nebraska needs, that South Dakota needs, is any, anyone needs uh, in, in natural disaster is your presence. And then um, the, the generosity of others to come alongside and to help. But we do pray for our neighbors in Nebraska that they do not lose hope, don't go into despair. But uh, in this time, they'd even come together and Nebraska would come out of this stronger. As people truly sacrifice for each other and work side by side and dig each other out and repair each other's homes and take care of each other in the meantime. And that as people are displaced, that those who have a home would be so generous and open their home and their hearts to those that have lost theirs. And for sweet Ethan, we thank you, God, for the improvement, but that uh, you would guide the doctors and whatever they need to know to help him and that, that you would even restore that, uh, that desire to eat and the ability to keep food in his little tummy and that he would be strong and uh, we continue to pray. You'd give peace to his family and that their faith we recognize is growing right now too. As they're praying, um, we know some urgent, incredibly deep, angst-filled prayers, trusting you with that little boy of theirs. So would you heal him, we ask. And then for Cindy, not here again today, God, you'd strengthen her. And she's undergoing probably the, the hardest part of the fight she's ever had with this cancer. And help her body tolerate the chemo, help her mind even bring herself to the center to to undergo the chemotherapy. And we're asking again, and it's a privilege to ask and to have asked all these years on behalf of our sister, your daughter, Cindy, that you would perform a genuine miracle. Would you kill the thing that's trying to kill her, kill the cancer? And then open our, open our understanding this morning to your word, your truth, and the same for the kids. And we know your spirit is going to speak as we go through this incredible story before us. And your spirit will customize in our minds and our hearts exactly what it is that you want to say. And we thank you for it. And we're going to say ahead of time, we receive it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, for many of us, the place where we get the most encouragement for our lives is from reading about the lives of those who went before us in the word of God. Those who understand struggle and sin and faith and victory. And this morning, we're going to read the story of Naaman, he's a military general, and his story is recorded in the fifth chapter of 2 Kings, and his story is in the Bible because his life crossed paths with the prophet Elisha, the successor of Elijah, and uh, Elijah in Hebrew, Elisha, is God the Savior, that's what his name means. Imagine naming your kid God the Savior. Not that your kid's God the Savior, but it's an honor of God. And that kid would always keep in mind, hopefully as they grow up, God's the solution. God's the Savior. And you know what? That defines Elisha's life. He points people, as we're going to see today, he points people to God who is the Savior that they need. Is that our job? Same for us. So as we continue in our Lessons from Legends series, I ask that you open your Bibles if you brought them. To 2 Kings chapter 5, we'll begin reading at the first verse, where we read this. 
Naaman. How many of you are familiar with Naaman? Okay, not a main is his actual name, not a main. And it means pleasant or delightful, though the guy is anything but that. Okay, but that's his name, not a main. It says Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Aram. Now that is Syria. Same thing. Aram, Syria, same. <clears throat> says he was a great man. And in high favor with his master. And that's the king of Aram. And he's in great favor with the king of Aram because it says, By him, by Naaman, the Lord had given victory to Aram. So I want to just stop right there and, and have you consider that God was involved in wars of pagan countries. Often Jews, back in the day when the Bible was being written and the day when Jesus walked the earth and talked to them, the Jews were fixated on the Jews. And they thought God was only interested in their lives, their nation. And, and Christians often can think that too. That, that God maybe is holding off to work in somebody's life until they become a Christian. Then God starts to work in their life. But I mean, you realize if somebody becomes a Christian, it's only because God has already been working in their life before they were a Christian. Remember what Jesus says in Matthew 5. He says, the way you got to treat people, don't just love those who are easy to love. Love those that are hard to love. Those that hate you. Because God loves those that are his enemies, which we all were. Which is why Jesus said, you know, God sends the sun and even nourishing rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous alike. So it says, verse uh, 5 continues, uh, The man, though a mighty warrior, uh, I'm sorry, this chapter, uh, verse 2, uh, the man, though a mighty warrior, suffered from what? Leprosy. Now, the kind of leprosy mentioned here, the actual word that, that you're reading describes, it's, it's the catch-all word for a number of serious skin issues that would affect somebody's body back in the day. Uh, and this would have been the type of disease that would eventually be fatal. There's no cure for this thing. And as you know, in Israel, uh, lepers were usually quarantined from the general public. But that wasn't always the case or the custom in other nations, which is why Naaman was able to live with his family and uh, carry out his duties as long as the, as the disease wasn't advanced enough to prevent him from doing so. Verse 2. Now the Arameans, the Syrians, on one of their raids had taken a young girl captive from the land of Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. And she said to her mistress, If only my lord were with a prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Okay, so the, the Syrians were known for a blitzkrieg type of warfare. They'd swoop in silent and unexpected, and they would decimate a place. And gen, uh, generally, adults were slaughtered. And the healthiest children and young adults were taken back to become slaves. And this little girl then would have been abducted from her parents during one of those uh, raids that Syria occasionally made on Israel, the northern kingdom. And she must have been something special because she was chosen to become the personal servant of Naaman's wife. And you can imagine the scene. One day while Mrs. Naaman is sitting in front of her mirror, maybe her servant girl is behind her brushing her hair. This young girl courageously and she respectfully offers a solution for her husband's health. And she knew exactly where Elisha was, this prophet that she is mentioning. And Elisha lived in Israel's capital city, which was Samaria. Uh, not to be confused with Judah's capital city of Jerusalem. Judah's the southern kingdom, Israel's the northern kingdom. Continues, verse 4, So Naaman went in and told his lord, this is the king of Syria, just what the girl from the land of Israel had said. And the king of Aram said, Go then, and I will send along a letter to the king of Israel. So he went, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of garments. He brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, 
When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you my servant Naaman, that you may cure him of his leprosy. Huh. I want you to remember verse 1, how this chapter opens. It says that Naaman is the commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man and held in high honor because he had given victory to the king as he led in its battles. And so the Syrian king, he knew that without a miracle, his right hand, his top military commander, would eventually die. And he didn't even question, if you notice, he didn't even question what Naaman said about what a little slave girl had said. Did you catch that? Why didn't the king question Naaman for believing some Israeli slave girl? Because at this point, they, they've probably tried everything to get Naaman well. And nothing's worked. And so they're desperate. And you know, when you're desperate, you'll try anything. So Naaman brings with him the, the equivalent of 750 pounds of silver. 150 pounds of gold. Ten sets of the finest clothes, all prized in the Near East. And he also carries a letter with him from his king to the king of Israel, stating, in matter-of-fact terms, that Naaman was to be cured. And I want you to imagine that Naaman is the Douglas MacArthur. He's the George Patton of Syria. And he's riding into Israel in his chariot, and he's accompanied by more soldiers in their chariots. And it's not the first time either that he's ridden into Israel. And he's come for war in the past, but not this time. And this letter from the king of Aram was supposed to assure the king of Israel that he's not here for war. But that's not how it's received. Verse 7. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to give death or life? That this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Just look and see how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me. So the king of Israel, he reads this and he thinks the king of Aram is ordering the king of Israel to personally heal Naaman or else. And he knows he doesn't have the power of God to do such a thing. So this must be some sick way to pick a fight. And so he tears his clothes, it says. And that was... Uh, Back then, how you indicated a lot of anxiety and distress. You just rip your clothes. You see, Israel and Aram had been at peace up to this point, but it appeared to the king of Israel, and that's King Joram at the time. Joram, you know that name, King Joram? Do you know who he is? He's the son of Ahab. Like Ahab and Jezebel, Ahab. And the king of Aram picked a fight with Joram's father and won. Which is why the son is a little concerned. And Joram doesn't realize that Naaman didn't expect King Joram to cure him of his leprosy. And if you notice, Elisha doesn't even enter the king's mind. Like, oh man, you got, you got the wrong guy. I know exactly who you need to talk to. And that's because King Joram didn't have any use for the prophet Elisha who constantly opposed him. Joram wanted little or no contact with Elisha as possible. It wasn't even on his radar. Verse 8, But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent a message to the king, Why have you torn your clothes? Because we're about the same frame. I totally would have taken him. I would have worn him. That's not what it says. It says, Let him come to me that he may know or that he may learn that there is a, what? Prophet in Israel. So word gets out, and word reaches Elisha, the king Joram was in a pickle. And so Elisha offers his services so that Naaman can learn that there's a prophet in Israel. What does that mean? It means that he may learn there's a real prophet in Israel. A real prophet actually exists. He's a real prophet because he serves the real God. False prophets were all over the place in that day. And Naaman's already consulted all those false prophets by now. The false prophets are the false gods. And he'd gotten nowhere. So Elisha's saying, send him to me so he can meet the real thing. And meet the real God. Verse 9. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and halted at the entrance of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, 
Go wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman, he became angry. He went away saying, I thought that for me he would surely come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and would wave his hand over the spots and clear the leprosy. Are not Abana and Farfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? And he turned and he went away in a rage. Do you notice verse 9? That Elisha is not awed. He's not impressed. He's not intimidated by this great general Naaman. Elisha doesn't even go to meet him. He doesn't even go to the front door. He sends his messenger to the door to deliver a simple prescription. Hey, dunk yourself underwater. All the way under. Seven times in what in that day was an unsanitary waterway. People did their laundry in there. They would go to the bathroom in there. They would wash their clothes in there. And Naaman blew a gasket. He hopped in his eight horsepower chariot and he was going to take off. Because he says, you know, he, he wanted Elisha to come out. And, and he was expecting Elisha to perform some extravagant ceremony, yell out to God and wave his hands around and kind of put his hands over over. Naaman's skin and heal him that way. And chances are Naaman was used to seeing the priests of his religion put on a show. You know, a little flash powder, a little puff of smoke, some big incantations. incantations. And, and, and Naaman, he truly believed that he would get healed right there on the spot. So this man's got some faith. But there's something he doesn't have. Humility. And so Naaman's going to get some humility before he gets some healing. The Jordan River was 20 miles away. And by chariot, that's a long, bumpy ride, I'm sure. And Naaman's ego has just been offended. He thinks he's just been asked to do the most ridiculous thing. And that Elijah's perhaps trying to, you know, humiliate him, verse 13. But his, his servants approached, means they, they catch up to him as he's tearing out. And they slow him down. Whoa, 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 whoa. You know, maybe helping to slow down his chariot. And they begin to reason with him. And they appeal to him. Right here. Father, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, would you not have done it? How much more when all he said to you was, wash and be clean. So they approach him tenderly, which was probably a very good idea. And they appeal to him as a father to be a reasonable and they say, listen, if the prophet would have asked you to do some great heroic task, you would have jumped right on it. You know, that would have fed his ego, too. Maybe he would have taken some credit for the healing. But they're saying, don't dis discount this requirement just because it's a simple thing. You know, what do you have to lose? Verse 14. So, Naaman went down, and he immersed himself seven times in the Jordan. I mean, I, I wonder. It goes down once. You can imagine. You know. No change. No visible improvement. Guys, this is a joke. Imagine the guys up on the shore. Keep going, Naaman. Come on, man. Two down. Come on. Five more times. <laughs> Nothing. Four times. Five times. Six times. No improvement. You imagine what he's thinking. Go on, Naaman. I mean, you can do it, man. Six down. One to go. And the Bible says, he immersed himself seven times in the Jordan according to the word of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a baby boy. And he was made clean. Then 
Then he returned to the man of God, he and all his company. He came and stood before him and said, Now I know, now I know, there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Please accept a present from your servant. The great Naaman says to Elisha, I'm your servant. I want to give you something. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives whom I serve, I will accept nothing. Naaman urged him to accept, but Elisha refused. Then Naaman said, if not, please let two mule loads of earth be given to your servant, for your servant will no longer offer burnt offering or sacrifice to any god except Yahweh, your God. So Naaman, he returns to express gratitude with gold, the silver, the clothes that he brought. The only gift Elisha wanted was what he just got. That Naaman now believed that there was no other God in all the earth but the God of Israel. I mean, would that not be the greatest gift you get as a follower of Jesus to make sure you help someone learn that he is what they need? I mean, that's the greatest gift you can get. And, and you notice that Elisha, he came out of his house to meet with Naaman this time. And as you know, if Elisha would have come out the first time and prayed over Naaman and Naaman was healed, what do you think Naaman would have thought? That Elisha had the power of a god. But Elisha, he purposely stays out of sight when Naaman first arrives. And then he tells Naaman that his healing is going to be far away from Elisha. It would come just between him and God. And if Naaman realized it or not, he was baptizing himself. In a new life of faith in the God of the Jews. And Naaman was choosing to believe that God would actually heal him if Naaman did the nonsensical thing that God asked him to do. And it was purposefully simple. It was designed to test Naaman's faith and humility. Just like how we are healed, everybody, of the eternal effects of our sins. By a simple belief that God will heal us if we believe that Jesus' death paid the price for the forgiveness of our sin. So Naaman, he becomes a believer in the God of Elisha right then and there. But in verse 17, did you catch this? He asked, can I at least take home two loads of dirt from Israel? Why would he ask that? Well, because the belief in that day, and it was for many Jews, was that your God could only be worshipped properly in its own land. So Naaman wanted to, to pick up loads of dirt from the land of Israel so that he could bring it home and stand on it and have a little Israel away from Israel and worship the God of Israel on God's own soil. So let me clarify. The belief in those days was that gods were territorial. There was no God over all the earth, just gods over areas. So Naaman, he's on a learning curve, and, and he now knows that there's only one God in all the earth, but not omnipresent over all the earth. Hopefully at one point he learned that about God. Then I want you to look at verse 18. But may the Lord pardon your servant on one account. Naaman's speaking to Elisha. He says, when my master, that's the king of Syria, goes into the house of Rimon to worship there, leaning on my arm, and I bow down in the house of Rimon, when I do bow down in the house of Rimon, may the Lord pardon your servant on this one count. And Elisha said to him, go in peace. So once Naaman returns home, one of his jobs would be, as it has been, to accompany the king in the temple of Rimon. That's the supreme deity of the, of the Arameans, the Syrians in the day. So Rahman's full name, catch this. Rahman's full name was Hadad Rahman. The name of the king of Syria that I haven't told you until now what his name was. His name was Ben Hadad II. Ben Hadad translates as son of Hadad. In essence, he was called by his nation son of God. 
And if you remember, that is what Pharaoh, Pharao, means as well. Son of Ra. That they believed the son was God. Pharaoh was the son of God. Ben-Hadad was the son of God. Hadad Rahman. And if you look at human civilizations throughout history, you'll find that it reveals to us that people have always instinctively known that God is beyond us, he's, he's above us, he's not one of us. But people still wanted a part of God on earth and in human form, a son of God. And so what I'm telling you is that the desire for Jesus, the Messiah, the son of God, is hardwired into the human being. We want to know our God through a son of God. It's why the world is still looking for, and the UN is still looking for, the perfect human. Who's godlike, which is why the Antichrist is going to make such a big impact when he shows up. Because it's hardwired into the human being. To want a relationship with the Son of God, Jesus, but they just don't know it. But back to Naaman's request. Once in the temple of Ramon, the king would take the arm of Naaman for support as he went to his knees to worship Ramon. That's what Naaman was describing. And then Naaman said, you know, he didn't have to get on his knees before Ramon as well. And Naaman is saying, you know, he's got to do this. And he may be bowing with his body, but he's not bowing in his heart. And he's asking Elisha, who was in good with God, you know, would you ask God, would you ask him to understand my predicament and forgive it? And Elisha, apparently he understood, and he sends him away with a traditional goodbye, you know, hey, go in peace. Don't, don't worry about it. See, Elisha doesn't expect Naaman to go from A to Z in his relationship with God right there. Elisha doesn't say, you can't do that. You'll be guilty of worshiping a false idol. He doesn't say that. I mean, names, name is what we might call a, a babe in Christ, before Christ. And, and you got to take it slow with newbies. Naaman at one point, hopefully, would realize he doesn't need to go into that temple. Maybe he'll have the opportunity, like Daniel, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, to stand when everybody else is bowing before Ramon. And we don't know if he ever had that moment. But I want you to consider as we close that the whole story in our Bibles here, the whole story is here because a little girl taken from her parents may have seen her parents killed. This little girl who had a wholehearted belief in her God and compassion for her captor, enough to point her captor to the God that he needed to know. That's why it's in your Bibles. And like Joseph, she knew why she was where she was. She, she, she recognized the moment. I'm sure she thought, this is a God thing. As much as she may have despised it, she realizes, I'm in God's Sovereign plan. I don't want to be here, but here I am. And she sees the opportunity. If she could point one of the highest, most revered, respected people in her country to her God, things may begin to change for the country, even for her own situation. I wonder what things were like when Naaman got home. How do you think that little girl was treated once he got home? Chances are she didn't feel like she was a slave at all. That she was treated like a princess. I wonder what else he may have asked her. Hey, listen, tell, tell me more about your God because I, I, I want to know who just healed me. I wonder who else he would have gotten to come over to the house. Hey, listen, you got to come over. Listen to this girl and listen about her God. And you know, he was telling her, but look at me. They all saw what he looked like. 
right before he had left, what he looks like now that he's returned, being healed from this God of Israel. Sometimes, like this little girl, you may go through something that, you know, like her, her captor, her captor is meant for evil, but God meant for good. Let's pray. God, we see ourselves in Naaman. Prideful, demanding, but in desperate need of you. And we recognize that you are the only God. You are omnipresent. And that you want us to look to you for our healing, if it is in your will to provide it or not. And we want to have a relationship with you, like Elijah did, to have an understanding that he had to direct people to life-altering moments with you where you would win their hearts. And we want to have the awareness of the slave girl who could see divine appointments and have the courage to act in the moment. Thanks, Linda. Okay, so Julie Rhodes just had to leave nursing home, just called her, her mom's real bad right now. Okay, and Tony knows about this, of course. Tony, do you need to get going too? You're okay for now? Okay, let's, let's pray. And Julie's mom's name? It's Dorothy. Okay, yeah, Dorothy. Let's pray, huh? Everybody, you, just, you start praying. Pray God guards her life. And if this be his will, extend her life. She has been struggling for so long. Get Julie there safe. Father, we're asking you, you, you take care of Dorothy right now. She belongs to you. She's your daughter. And we do pray you would extend her life. And listen, for anybody that needs some prayer, you need a little extra prayer today. Uh, again, we're gonna have people, we'll be in the, in the back. They'll be just standing. They can go there now. And then you can get up and walk in the back. Um, they'll have a little card on there. It says prayer usher. They're gonna help usher you right there with your need right to the throne of God, okay? Now this song talks about Elijah, not Elisha. And I don't think we have permission to change the the name but we love the song these are the days of Elijah right these are the days that we're, we're praying for this we want this to happen one
wonderful day. God bless you. From the top. One, two, three.